For more information, please visit our website, brias.com, and don't miss all the free educational material on educationbybrias.com. Hello and welcome to the BRIAS webinar, How to Start Mechanical Insulation Exflation with Tina Anderson. But before we get started, my name is Michelle Chatwin and I am the Global Clinical Specialist at BRIAS. I'm happy to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our 2021 series. For those of you that have attended some of our previous webinars, you'll know that we alternate between two ventilation webinars and one airway clearance. Moving forward, and our webinars will be hosted on the last Thursday of each month. A recording will become available via our educational platform, educationbybrias.com, in about a week from now. We welcome you to post questions in the Q&A chat function that you'll find on the right hand upper corner of your screen, and we'll address questions at the end of Tina's talk. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tina. She's a physiotherapist by background and she's based at the Norwegian Advisory Unit for Long-Term Mechanical Ventilation in Bergen. Tina practices daily in the fields of ventilation and cough augmentation in individuals with neuromuscular disease, including ALS, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy. She continues her postdoctoral research in this area and for those of you that are unfamiliar with her work she's provided us with detailed information on the upper airway in health as in disease. She's highlighted the response of the upper airway to mechanical insufflation, exflation and ventilation. I always find her talks incredibly enlightening and I can't wait for today's presentation so without further ado Tina I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. What an introduction. If my mother had heard that, she would be crying with emotions now. And I, I want to thank you, Andreas, for invitation to have this speech uh, in your webinars, how to set, start mechanical insufflation, exufflation. I will start to share with, share my presentation. Uh, and we started with MIE treatment for over 20 years ago. Um, in June 2001, we got our first Emerson Coffesis device and uh, we started with neuromuscular patients. An 11, 11 year old girl with uh, spinal muscular atrophy type 2, she was our first patient in acute setting. And she was in and out from the hospital, uh, lots of secretions, weak cough and several pneumonias. And the effect of this treatment was spectacular. It was really rapid and it was massive. And um, we had really got a tool which uh, could make a difference. And that time, how did we uh, set up the, the treatment. Well, we found articles and book chapters that John Buck had written of, of this topic and uh, it was fantastic. It was clear to the point. Uh, these patients need high pressures, rapid insufflation and expulsive exufflation. And two years later, Michel Chatwin started to publish well-designed studies. He showed that even lower treatment pressures had effect. Miguel, yeah. Concalves from Portugal, he has convinced us that also other patients with weak cough can get benefits and documented to use in the ICU. And Hesse Sancho uh, from Spain, he was the first to give us an inner look of uh, upper airways during the MIE treatment. And he has been a big inspiration for me for my research later. Uh, Michel Chatwin, together with uh, Michel Toussaint, have bring several clinicians together to, to meetings and uh, encourage us to professional discussions uh, exactly how these techniques are used clinically. And these discussions are disseminated in publications and affected further how we start and use MIE. 
Britt Hoof, a good colleague of not many years from Oslo, she uh, has started her PhD work to optimize the MIA treatment for children and has inspired me a lot the recent years. And this is a field where we are still definitely learning. And this ENMC guideline stated that people with NMD, they need use cough support daily. But this need is not fixed and changed with age, deterioration and disease progression. And these changed needs and capacity affect how to MIE use in the real world. And since we don't have evidence what the effective dosage is, we need individualized and, and patient-centered approach how this is used in practice. Uh, MIE, it should be effective to clear the airways and it should be tolerated for the patient to be comfortable, maintain upper airways open and to be safe. And to aim this, uh, we need really an individualized and patient-centered approach. Uh, first, when I meet a new patient, I try to detect will and can my patient participate active to MIE treatment. And Peak of flow values will tell us, yes, the patient needs cough support if the peak of flow is below 180 liters per minute. If patients still have spontaneous inspiration, they can trigger the insufflation and we can use patient spontaneous inspiration and assist that with the device insufflation. If we hear the cough sound, we know that the patient managed, managed to perform glottic closure and opening and we can certainly use that in the treatment and if patient is in an acute state we need that they need more support uh, in acute state than in chronic condition. So I think that we have gone from totally passive uh, uh, cough assistance to more supportive cough assistance and our goal as therapist is to get patient and device work together as they would dance tango. And in tango dance, there is always a leader and follower and these parts are changing during the dance. And the leader gives openings to the follower what to do and the follower then choose how she he'll, will respond. So the patient may be triggers the insufflation, the device respond, the patient again respond and so on. But remember, both we as therapists and patients, we are all beginners one day and we all need both uh, experience, rehearsal, training to come uh, become real artists. So in the following, I will have a very clinical approach how to set up uh, MIE uh, treatment. And when we meet the patient for the first time, we start to inform them verbally uh, what the device does. It insufflates, it exufflates lungs, then it gives you more powerful uh, cough. It will help you to get your secretions up. Then we let the patient feel the flow from the mask against their hand, and we give few insufflations in manual mode. And often patients who never have used a face mask, uh, we introduce the treatment with the mouthpiece. And it is just for the, the introduce the treatment and we go very rapidly to the mask uh, if we haven't uh, started with that. Then we just uh, try it out. And mask, uh, there is several sizes and uh, sizes and types, and we try to find one that is comfortable and try to avoid leaks. Um, if your patient have a tracheostomy, you just choose the connector that fits and can be cleaned or thrown. We use silicone connectors that can be cleaned and used uh, again and again and again. But it's much easier to introduce the uh, treatment for the tracheostomized patients, so it's much more like plug and play. Uh, remember, when holding the mask, we try to ensure a good mask seal, but please don't push the jaw inwards uh, that will uh, close the upper airways. And new technology has come with new settings and give us new thoughts, new ideas how to, to use this device. Uh, in this presentation, I have just focused in those most necessary settings, uh, what we really need, and then just a little bit about more 
comfort settings. And cough, it consists of three phases where the cough starts with the deep inspiration and the aim with this phase is to give a sufficient volume to the lungs. And we can uh, assist it with insufflation phase and the necessary settings here is pressure, our pressure, rise time or insufflation uh, flow uh, and insufflation time. And also triggering can play a role here. The second, second uh, cough phase is glottic closure and the device cannot mimic this, but it can by switching from the positive to negative pressure, it uh, gives uh, a rapid uh, uh, flow change that is often uh, used in glottic closure and opening. The third phase of the cough is forceful expiration expression where aim is to increase the airflow and exufflation settings of pressure uh, is important here but we also believe that time has something to say and when we start this we uh, i usually choose triggering on i use a little bit lower pressures to insufflation than exufflation and sh uh, longer times for insufflation than exufflation uh, in patients with no bulbar insufficiency, I always choose high low, but if there is bulbar insufficiency, I always choose low. Uh, and then we start to titrate the settings for this individual patients. And um, in insufflation, we try to uh, find a good rise and fall in chest wall and abdomen and the patient feels that they get the deep breath in and we will observe the volumes from the device screen there. In during exufflation we can try to hear if cough sounds better and stronger, are secretions brought up to the mouth and does patient feels that the cough feels stronger and we can also observe the peak of low values from from the screen. Last year, Michelle Chatwin, uh, she published this paper where she had a flow chart. Uh, how can we set up an MIE treatment in, in automatic mode times? And for all who are doing this in clinically practice, I really recommend this reading. Uh, we do this very in very similar uh, ways. And how do we end up with the settings in long term treatment? Uh, this paper is from Britt Hall, where she made a survey of patients, pediatric patients using MIE in long term settings. And she saw that both time and pressure settings were increasing uh, with an age. However, there was really, really big variations how this was used clinically. Um, in Michelle Chatwin's uh, population, uh, they presented also how uh, patients are using this device and they had uh, most of the patients in uh, automatic modes. That's what we also do. Um, settings uh, varied, um, but the, the common was that the insufflation pressure was lower than exufflation pressure. This was both in adults and children. Uh, that was what was different from our patients. They always choose high inspiratory flow profile and they used very little um, oscillations, but we maybe use a little bit more. OK, you remember the girl who was 11 years old 20 years ago? Well, Marita, she lives still. She survived. She claims that the MIE device has uh, has uh, something to do with that. Uh, she will tell us now how what kind of settings her MIE device is using. I have a lot of programs on the machine. I have a lot of programs on the machine. I have a lot of programs on the machine. Eh, hvis jag är sjuk så har jag ett eget program för det, men det justeras ju också hvis jag är eh, väldigt sjuk så vet du om man justerar för det sammen med dåliga läge då. Men när jag på det status så har jag tre nivåer där det ena på något sätt är till eh, vardags lätt eh, försörjelse eh, och det andra är mot eh, kraftig försörjelse i lång tanke. Eh, och det tredje har jag på något sätt mot Mest mot lungebetennelse, men den har også en sånn der vibrering. 
så gör det ändå lite mer effektivt. Och så har jag ulikt styrka på både eh, inpust och utpust på dessa tre eh, stegen av programmering. So Marita has three COV programs where the everyday settings has a little bit lower pressure settings than the uh, uh, programs which she used with chest cold or pneumonia. She always used triggering and medium insufflation flow and the insufflation time is slightly longer in uh, programs where she needs more power. And the thir third program, which she primarily used when she has pneumonia, has also oscillation because she feels that when she has strict ticker uh, secretions, this will help her to get uh, those uh, easier up. And triggering, it's something I recommend to use and try because patients can decide by themselves when the insufflation starts. And this will be a really important to get this tango between device and patient. Um, however, if the patient have mucus plugs, uh, the triggering won't work. And if patient, your patient have often mucus plugs, maybe it's better to turn off. Uh, in our tracheostomized patients who can have mucus plugs, we have always program three that has uh, triggering off. So caregivers will change that very rapidly. And how the device detects this uh, triggering uh, when patient inhales, uh, the flow change is detected by the device and it starts the automatic set timed insufflation and exufflation. However, it's always patients who decide how long time they will use before the next insufflation and they, they really get a better experience of, of the device. This active inspiration is also important to open up to larynx, uh, the upper airways prior to the insufflation, because there is a phasic relationship between a uh, diaphragma and the only abducting muscle in the larynx PCA muscle. So when we activate our diaphragma, we also activate the PCA muscle and the larynx opens. So that will create better conditions to the airflow uh, into the lungs. And when we start uh, to detrate, uh, we just set some time settings. And uh, this is just start the titration and it will be adjusted individually afterwards or sometimes also during the treatment pressure setting. Um, and I often consider uh, the patient due to their size and stiffness of thorax and their respiratory rate. But you can, if you have patient with ventilator, you can take the inspiratory time there and add a half of second for insufflation and patients without ventilator we often start with one and a half up to two and a half seconds uh, concerning the size. Exufflation phase we choose to have a little bit shorter at once and then we titrate it uh, upwards. And um, when we start to titrate I always use active instruction to patient to breathe in and exhale with the device and then breathe in and cough with the device. And a few cycles with one pressure and then we gradually increase the pressures up, uh, consider the patient experience and feedback uh, they give. But usually this is done very quickly in, in five minutes and we come up to the treatment pressures and very often we end up with higher exflation pressures than insufflation pressures. Um, and as I mentioned in, in the start, uh, John Buck uh, advocated to use high pressures uh, in neuromuscular patients and we, we have being there, we have used very high pressures. I, I think we use more asymmetrical pressures uh, now. And as Michelle Chatwin showed in already in 2003, also these lower treatment pressures will increase the peak of flow uh, for these patients. And in her latest uh, uh, publication about the MIE, she also showed that several diagnosis groups have uh, asymmetrical treatment pressures in, in the long term uh, use. Uh, 
So I will say yes, please, to both high and low, pressure, low pressures. Uh, and we should individualize uh, this and uh, ask the patient what they prefer. Some patients really, really prefer very high pressures. And remember that the aim with the insufflation is to get a sufficient inspiratory volume. And we can achieve this also combining lower pressures over longer time. Tracheostomized patients need higher pressures because the artificial airways are making more resistance to the airflow and we need to increase the pressures to achieve these uh, high peak expiratory flows. And patients with tracheostomy often they have ventilator and if they have it, we choose the ventilator inspiratory pressure plus five centimeters of water. If not, uh, in ventilator, we start with higher pressures than with non-invasive patients, about 25-30 centimeters of water, and then go very rapidly up to the treatment pressures. And concerning the time settings, we use the, the titration the same time, uh, same manner as in non-invasive patients. Uh, in my via tracheostomy, uh, compared to non-invasive patients, it's much easier because uh, the cannula is bypassing the upper respiratory tract, so it's easier to introduce and, uh, and titrate, and there is no mass clicks. And our tracheostomized patients primarily have a severe bulbar insufficiency and danger for aspiration, so we use coughed cannulas and during MIE treatment we inflate cough. And always remember to perform a short and shallow suctioning in the cannula and just below after the MIE treatment to avoid uh, plugging. Spectacular Rachel Moses from the UK, she and her colleagues, including John Buck, has uh, made a guidance how to set up MIE treatment in adults with endotracheal tube. And they recommend pressures up to 70 and, uh, and insufflation and exufflation times up to four cent, uh, seconds. And Miguel from Portugal, uh, he uh, has described that he used high pressures of 40 uh, insufflation and exufflation also just after the uh, extubation. Uh, and this works uh, well. And these patients are often very weak, so they will uh, need uh, support. OK, insufflation flow or insufflation race time, race time is, is the same. It's the time taken to achieve the insufflation pressure. So illustrated here in this figure, the high flow is illustrated with the black line and it's a quick rise time. Low flow is illustrated with the yellow line. Uh, it's slower rise time. Uh, Marcia Volpe, she uh, had a study where they decreased actively insufflation flow. And this will give a higher expiratory flow bias that is important for mucus movement. And they had a bench study where they had secretions in a, a, a lung model, and they showed that also these secretions are moving more effective outwards. Uh, with reducing inspiratory flow. But remember, if we reduce insufflation flow, that can affect volumes and uh, uh, to get a sufficient uh, insufflation volume, we maybe need a little bit longer inspiration time or a little bit higher pressure. OK, so now we have set the pre uh, pressure and then we can concentrate to the times. And then I ask my patient, please, can you just think about the insufflation phase? Uh, is it OK or is it too short or is it too long? And do the, the feedback, I do the adjustments and then we try again. Feedback again, and when we are happy, I, I ask them to think just exufflation. Is it okay? Is it too short? Is it too long? And then we make adjustments on the same way. If patient is not using triggering, I do also the same with the pause. So after the exufflation, before the next insufflation, do you think you have enough time or is it too short? And during 
also both best pressure and time settings, we should notice the chest wall movements and observe the volumes from the device screen. Uh, do we get the good chest expansion? Do we get uh, the air out? And what happens during the pause between exufflation and insufflation? Is patient holding their breath? Uh, are they very having very rapid uh, breathing between these uh, sets. Does it seem natural or unnatural? And how long exufflation time do we need if we only consider the peak of flow values? We really need very short times. Uh, Romain Lachal from France, he performed a bench study and described that this peak of flow happens very rapidly after uh, uh, the start of the exuflation phase. But another guy from France, Mathieu Lacombe, he has introduced some other outcome measures where, she, where he has first determined the uh, effective flow, 180 liters per minute, and then he has calculated the volume above this flow uh, value. That is effective puff volume and calculated the time a uh, patient is uh, having about this flow value, effective cough time. And he suggests that there might be a clinically relevant efficacy factor that is time dependent. And as a clinician, I, I agree with Matthew. I tried to find out how my patient prefers to cough. Is the cough <coughs> a short cough or <laughs> a long exufflation cough? And these are very preliminary data from our data set where I measured um, uh, registered flow during a different kind of a subjects coughing with MIE device. And I find out that even the uh, device were, were set with the same settings, two seconds in and two seconds out. Some subjects had a flow over a long time and some patients just over a very short time. And somebody needs longer exufflation time and somebody needs shorter exufflation time. And we don't see this on the screen and we don't always have pneumotox to measure this, but inspired from uh, Antonio Rios in Spain, he used stethoscope as cervical auscultation to try to detect uh, uh, if the air is flowing in the uh, airways, are the airways open, but this can also guide you to know how the patient is performing the expulsion. Okay, then we can think, does this tango between patient and device needs any additional settings? And what we have to offer here, we can ask them if they like oscillations and oscillations we can um, choose off or we can choose them on insufflation only or on exufflation only or on both in an exufflation and uh, it has some show from Spain who has performed a couple of studies with the ALS patients using oscillations and he haven't found any benefits uh, to, to do this but if we need, if we want to try this, we need to set both amplitude and frequency of oscillations. And in this math piece, I have tried to keep very simple values. Uh, we have chosen generally inhale and exhale pressure of 40 and inhale and exhale time of two seconds both. Then we have oscillation settings. OK, I choose amplitude of 10 centimeters of water and frequency of 10 hertz. That means 10 beats per second. And this will end up with a setting where in inspiratory pressure is uh, swinging between 50 and 30 centimeters of water and exhale pressure is swinging between 50 and 30 of negative pressure. And the patient will receive 20 oscillations per uh, insufflation and exufflation phase. Well, there have been discussions. Will the addition of the oscillation ever be beneficial? Oscillations are mainly related to the peripheral airway secretion clearance. Um, in our laryngeal studies, we 
observed that some ALS patients had totally collapsed during these maneuvers with insufflation extraflation, but when we added oscillations, it was the more dynamic openings and closures. And if we need to choose between those two things, I will choose to have these dynamic openings and closures. Marita, she told us she feels that the oscillations are more effective nor she has pneumonia and that might be related that oscillations create more turbulent flow in the airways that might be more effective to the thicker secretions. But we always let the patient choose what they prefer. OK, pre post insufflations. Here I have made three different examples. First one, there is five coughs and then one insufflation into end of the session. In the second example, we have three post, uh, pre and post insufflations with a little bit lower uh, pressure. And in the last 10 insufflations to prime and then three coughs and again one inspiration into end. And I think that in the start, if patients have lots of secretions that are coming up, uh, we focus on evacuation of that and end with exufflation. But when these secretions get uh, less, we concentrate lung volume recruitment and always end with the insufflations. Okay, a little bit about bulbar insufficiency and MIE. Let us meet another patient. Vivian, she has an ALS. She got the diagnosis for five years ago after she gave birth to her uh, youngest child. And she had a bulbar type of ALS, so she will not have a voice on this video because she has just written her experiences, uh, how we set up and have treated her settings during her disease progression. OK, there we go. <laughs> Sorry for that. This last video is just a few, uh, couple of weeks uh, old. And Vivian, she is uh, a blogger. She's one of the uh, Norway's, Norway's, Norway's most uh, read blogs, uh, writing about having ALS and being a mother uh, to, to four uh, children. In these pulver patients, we always also need to have pay attention to saliva retention in the upper airways. This is a case report from Jody Allen, uh, where they demonstrated that these positive pressures with the MIE device may blow the uh, saliva to the lungs and cause aspiration. So be aware of, of that. And upper airways, we can visualize what happens inside in the throat 
uh, with the technique called transnasal fiber optic laryngoscopy. And we can do this examination while we are doing MIE maneuvers. And somebody calls this technique for endoscope. Uh, we work with otolaryngologists, so they prefer laryngoscopy, and that's why we do that also. And normal responses in the larynx to MIE is an opening during insufflation. They manage the quality closure when we instruct them and when they learn it. And during exufflation, you have an opening, but you have several glottic closures often during an exufflation phase. Insufflation seems to provoke glottic closure, as here. But also closure in the structures above in the supraglottic level. And this is the most prominent finding we have found in our Bulbar ALS patients. All of them had this with high pressures. Also during exufflation, we have seen that it can be very narrow in the hypopharyngeal room and in the laryngeal level. And it's very individually how these uh, larynxes look like. It's uh, very individually as we look outside. Uh, when we have followed up patients with spinal ALS, we have tried to find out what happens first, the insufflation closure or the exufflation closure. And in our calculations, it looks like that the insufflation closure always happens first in the disease progression. And if we don't get uh, uh, volumes in with the insufflation and then provide an exufflation, it creates a vacuum in the upper airways and it will collapse. We have suggested that the bulbar ALS patients should have fine-tuned insufflation settings. We should ensure triggering on every insufflation to provoke this opening prior to the insufflation. Uh, we should decrease both the flows and inspiratory pressures, and we should increase the inspiratory time to still achieve a sufficient inspiratory volume. And with this approach, we have seen that the patients manage to keep their upper airways open longer in their disease progression. And these patients need follow up uh, during the disease progression because their cough is altered and alters uh, uh, over the time. Uh, and somebody starts to swallow and starts uh, having retching during MIE maneuvers. Uh, and these rapid MIE cycles can be very challenging or impossible for them. And these patients need a little bit more time, both for insufflation and then maybe a rapid exufflation, and more time between the exufflation and the next insufflation. And if you don't have transnasal fiber optic laryngoscopy available, or you don't have any anybody who can help you to scope, you can use your uh, stethoscope and hear the flow. Do you hear that there is a shh? air is flowing, but be aware the glottic closure and opening can be very loud for your ears if the patient is uh, able to do that. OK, then we will have a little bit about MIE setup in children and children are very many. They are in different sizes and ages, so we will have a case. It's one year old girl with the SMI spinal muscular atrophy who is breathing very rapidly. Uh, the saturation is OK, but the, there is lots of secretion sounds. And prior to the we start with the MIE, we try to find us a position that keep the upper airways open. There is support behind the neck uh, and we feel the flow in and out when they are breathing. This is also important in, in those hypertonic ALS patients. Um, with this child, we start with single insufflations first with one and a half seconds of, of time and uh, low pressures. And when we are up to two to three insufflations, we can increase the pressure with five centimeters of water. And same time, observe 
do we get good filling in, in the chest and try to have good mask seal uh, all the time. And note if insufflation volumes gets better when we increase uh, the pressure. And often positive pressures of 20 to 25 centimeters of water is enough. And when you are happy with the volumes, you can add exufflation and we can add same exufflation pressure as we ended up with insufflation pressure, for example, plus 20, minus 20 uh, with a duration of one second exufflation. And then you just need to concern if you need the increased exufflation pressure higher, does, the, does it feel um, uh, here better, uh, feel more powerful does we get secretions up and it's very useful to end up with asymmetric treatment pressures here also. This high respiratory frequency might lead to very rapid breathing between exufflation and next insufflation and that's okay and we end up the treatment session with uh, post insufflations. And generally in children have a positive attitude. We should have that with adults as well. We can help you and we can help your child. I will never say this is uncomfortable. This may be unfamiliar feeling when you get your mask on and get these pressures in and out. And parents, they are central as caregivers, so we should um, uh, um, aim to get both parents and child comfortable with the treatment and we must, uh, must use much more Im imagination than with adults, use toys, teddy bears, parents as, as self and we must count that introducing and titrating the settings takes some longer time and use praise and encourage. And we increase the exufflation time when child gets older or start to mimic uh, uh, cough during exufflation and if they are acute sick uh, increased pressures and uh, these advices uh, uh, I have got from Brett Hoof, uh, from Oslo and in her study in another study of her she used um, a test lung lung model where she increased pressure systematically and also increased times and tried to identify these green areas of peak or flow measurements uh, that is uh, uh, aim in the treatment and she saw that both uh, uh, combining lower uh, treatment um, pressure for insufflation than exufflation uh, gave good values but if you choose to use very high pressures you should have very much short time for inspiration Okay, so we have get some settings here and then we need to consider how to perform the treatment. Here, see Marita using her device here, communicating with her eyebrows, arms, fingers, with the caregiver, what she wants. Um, if she, if patient need additional manually assisted cough, how many cough cycles, how many sessions, how often to perform the treatment. And usually we have from three to seven in exufflations, usually use manually assisted cough if this is uh, uh, possible. We repeat this until the mucus is evacuated and recommend to use the treatment two to three days, uh, two to three times a day, more in chest colds. And maybe in familiarization phase, uh, it can be good to have several treatment settings where the stage one has lower settings and then when patient is comfortable with them in home use, they can uh, increase to the stage two or stage three. Or to have uh, more powerful settings during uh, chest calls as Marita. Uh, use mucus plug program without triggering uh, if that's a problem and ask your patient what do they prefer. So in summary, uh, try to find out can will my patient participate active, start with the necessary settings, there are many ways to roam, then if needed use comfort settings or just try them out. Uh, have an individualized and patient-centered approach and include your patient to the decision making. It always takes two to tango. And if somebody wonders if I'm a tango dancer, I can answer I'm not, but I can do 
pretty elegant headstand with my skis on. Thank you for your attention. And I also want to thank um, Marita and Vivian who wanted to join this session with their uh, experiences, Brit Hove and uh, my colleagues here at the Hotel. So Tina, that was an excellent presentation. We've had so many questions coming in, but first of all, everyone who has been communicating how brilliant that was. So thank you. I think we've all learned an awful lot. Um, you've, I've got one question for you first from me, which you've told us what happens to the upper airway in insufflation, but you didn't tell us why you think it happens. Oh, you are so clever, Michelle. <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> well, uh, we don't know why it happens, but we can think the larynx, larynx is an organ that is like a valve. So it will, if we would be engineers, we would be called larynx as a valve. It closes when it uh, to protect the lungs so that food or drinks are not going to the lungs, but we close the, the, the larynx. And in these patients, when this happens, their neurological pathways are not normal. So this must be uh, disturbed somehow. But also some healthy persons have these reflexes. And, and if our patient says, ah, now that was not good, it might have happened something that is not um, um, so good. <laughs> Thank you ah. for your question. Yeah. No, no, that, that, that makes sense. Thank you. So Miguel asks, do you believe that there is a good correlation between the efficacy of peak cough flow with MIE and the ability for the patient to be able to breath stack to produce a good maximum insufflation capacity? And he clarifies it. In other words, if neuromuscular patients, Duchenne, ALS and SMA, practice routinely MIC, are they more likely to have better results with mechanical insufflation exufflation in the acute situation? As he, this is something he's seen in his practice because of the glottic training, but he would like your opinion on what he's been seeing. Yeah, yes, it, it uh, sounds very uh, reasonable uh, for me. And um, in acute settings, you have had this tube uh, through this very sensitive larynx that is trying to find out is something threatening me. And when you take the tube out, it uh, maybe don't have the good control. So I think the focus and and uh, having more focus in training of, of clotic closure and opening can have uh, something to do here. I don't know if it's also the same with the bulbar ALS patients because they have lost their ability. So. It's, it's not necessarily the same. Good question, Miguel. Uh, don't worry, he's got more for you later <laughs> on. <laughs> um, so in a ventilated patient, and this is a question I often get asked as well, um, either a tracheostomy or an ET tube, is there a risk of using such high pressures, for example, plus 50, plus 70, uh, when they're on a peak airway pressure of 30 centimetres of water. So I think the question is that we're always very concerned about using high pressures due to barotrauma, but we know that with an artificial airway, we need to use a high pressure to overcome the resistance. But could there be clinical consequences of doing this? Mm. Yes, there is a few case reports uh, in the literature as well that describes pneumothorax uh, in patients using MIE and, and ventilator. And I think if the patient has demanding, uh, is demanding increased pressures with ventilator as well, there might be a higher risk to, to get this. But of course, we don't need to use so um, higher pressures than needed. So if you uh, start a, a, a treatment and you get secretions up already with the 35, 40 centimeters of water, it's enough. And 
maybe try here as well to limit the insufflation pressures to be lower than exufflation pressures. Yeah, what I, I think I agree with you. I think it's a really good tip and it's all that building up rather than going in very high at the start. Mm. We agree. Uh, you agree. <laughs> That's what you um, So currently, uh, Christian says that we only have a Philips E70 at their hospital. However, patients will receive the Clearway 2. Would you say it's required to have a Clearway 2 in order to use the compliance of the patient when using mechanical ventilation? Um, as I've seen that there are de 10 different strengths to deliver the flow. Mm. So I think. The, the yes. Yeah. So the question is about the insufflation flows and yes. the range is bigger. Yes, and I, I think um, I'm not completely sure, but I think the technology is a little bit different between these devices uh, that uh, with E70 you have three stages and in uh, with the NIPI you have 10 sta stages which are and those are considering the set pressure and set time. Um, in very severe bulbar patients, that's really my uh, experience, <laughs> my small experience with the NIPI, uh, that that can have uh, effect. But anyway, I would try those out. But if you don't have available that device, it's not helping you anyway. So you just need to use what you have. So Marika asks, are there any studies on using mechanical insufflation exflation in children with cerebral palsy and severe mental retardation? And do you use it in that population? Yes, there is a couple of studies. Brit who can much more about this topic than me. Uh, and we she also uh, published recently a study describing our pediatric MIE population where very many CP uh, child had uh, a cough assist device or MIE device. So, but I don't know if it's because they have really effect on that or that we are a country where it's available for patients that we consider need this treatment. So if you don't have any other options, you just start with that. <laughs> I don't know what, what, why it's uh, that way. Mm. Fantastic. You mentioned about patients who require mechanical insufflation exflation who don't have a ventilator. And I agree that with this, these patients typically seem very overlooked. Which patients do you consider to be at risk and should have a ventilator, uh, should have a cough assessment who don't have a ventilator? Oh, OK, it can be children with the uh, neuromuscular disorders that don't have uh, hyperventilation yet. Uh, it can also be ALS patients, spinal cord uh, injury patients who don't need a uh, ventilator, but they have a weak cough uh, still. Because you can think the breathing is like uh, walking, but coughing is like sprinting. And if you have weak muscles, you lose your sprinting ability first before walking. Yeah, I mean, we found that a lot of the SMA2s that didn't require ventilation perhaps were in the early days not referred on. Um, and like you've said, the CB population, it, it may be that they benefit, it may be that they don't. Mm. Um, Miguel asks, do you have any experience in observing the upper airway in children with SMA1? You've convinced him with your research that ALS patients need individualised MIE parameters. And, pe and can be guided by the visualization to prevent upper airway collapse. But children with SMA1, um, which is lower motor neuron, the upper airway is floppy, he feels, rather than overtoned. Um, and what can you expect in this group of patients with regards to their response to yeah. the device? We published a case report now in, in this year. It's the first author is Volsetter. But if, if you uh, search my name on PubMed, you will find this publication as well, uh, where we scoped a one year old girl with SMI type one. And we found 
the same response as with bulbar ALS patients with with the pressure, insufflation pressure, she had said 35 centimeters of water. And we decrease it, decrease it uh, in after these examinations to 25, uh, and it was better. So I believe this is an area we have not made research yet, and this can be clinically important to do that. So we have started the study with our uh, SMA population here in Norway. Um, and um, yes, definitely. And children, they are so children with SMA one. They are used to get the nasal suctioning, so they usually tolerate this. Oh, usually, I don't know usually, but they seem to tolerate this well. Mm. While we're talking about SMA one, obviously things have drastically changed with nisinersen and gene therapy. Um, so. Miguel also says I have children with SMA1 that are now behaving like SMA2. More time off the ventilator, ability to breath stack. He'd love to know, um, love you to see the evolution of the upper airway reaction to mechanical insufflation in these patients as MIE continues to be a life-saving technique for them. So I, I think he's saying, could you have a little look in that area? Yeah. <laughs> Rather than asking a question. But yeah. We okay. will. <laughs> yeah, we are doing that. <laughs> Thank you. And um, this is a really interesting question. People um, often ask about cuff up or cuff down with a tracheostomy and the use of MIE and would value your thoughts on that. Yeah, our patients um, in long term, they have curved cannulas, as I mentioned, because they have bulbar insufficiency and danger for aspiration. So we inflate the, the cuffs. And um, but if there is no danger for aspiration, you can use it without uh, inflating the cuff. So another thank you, Tina, for sharing. Um, for ALS patients with bulbar dysfunction, in your opinion, how can we tell the use of MIE will pose to be more of a risk than providing benefit in the bulba patients as they decline. How do you determine that MIE is not recommended during the late stages of ALS with bulba dysfunction? So at what stage in ALS do you determine that MIE is of no benefit? Well, or do, or when, do you ever get to that point because you're so <laughs> individualized and no, no, we always get to that point because the disease is progressive. So when the patient do not manage to use that any anymore, but that we have done everything we can, <laughs> we can do it. If the patient is old, uh, they are tired. Of course, we need to consider how much effort will we do with with uh, trying out different things. But uh, I think it's good to look if the patient agrees into the larynx, because if it's totally dysfunctional as well, we can say, OK, if the tracheostomy is, is uh, wanted, maybe you should perform that now and not wait longer. Um, is there any medication that can be used to reduce upper airway collapse during MIE? Not that I know, but if not somebody knows, you, you, I'm really interested to hear about that. Fabulous. That's fa thank you, Tina. We've come to the end of today. I know that people may have questions, and I know that you're an avid Twitterer. So <laughs> if, I've, if I've got it right, you're at Tina Anderson. Yes. Can people direct message you if there's anything further? Of course. Of so, course, and thank you for your attention.